Hello, and welcome back to We're Not So Different, a podcast about how we've always been idiots. My name is Luke. I'm an amateurish historian, and as always, I am joined by Dr. Eleanor Yanega, who is anything but. Uh, today, we are talking a little bit about the shift from uh, feudalism to capitalism, the Thirty Years' War, and more with a very special guest. Um, and in light of this guest, we are uh, once again forgoing our question this week, uh, but it will come back next time. So, um, you know, over the course of nearly 100 episodes, we've covered a whole lot of topics on the show, far too many to count, really. But there were a few we would like we do like to revisit quite often, even some some of some that occur outside the medieval era. We typically call home. Of course, there's historical materialism. You'll no doubt recall that we spent a long time following the materialist trajectory of history, focusing extensively on the centuries-long transition from the feudal mode of production to the capitalist one. Then there's the Holy Roman Empire, the most thoroughly medieval institution ever to exist. Uh, And it kept going like that even after the era ended. In addition to being a constant source of humor in our daily lives, we also did a short series on the HRE recently that tracked its history into the early modern era. Uh, We finished that series with a full episode about the pivotal Thirty Years' War, concluding that it was fairly important. Uh, Then there's the Protestant Reformation, the end of manorialism across early modern Europe, and the ongoing changes in warfare that all feed into the Thirty Years' War. Seeing as how we return to those topics so often, we figured it would be nice to have a guest to come on the show and talk about them in a little more depth. And that's why we are happy to welcome Matt Chrisman. Uh, by way of introduction, Matt is one of the co-hosts of the highly successful uh, Chapo, Trap House, Chapo Trap House podcast and uh, also hosts weekly Twitch streams. Additionally, Matt co-hosted the Hell of Presidents podcast series with Chapo producer Chris Wade, which tracked the material power and circumstances of the presence of the United States from 1776 to the present day. But Matt is really here to talk with us today about his and Chris's new successor series to Hell of Presidents, which is called Hell on Earth and will be released on the Chapo Patreon feed beginning in January 2023. Hell on Earth follows the progression of the Thirty Years' War and how it created the circumstances that allowed capitalism to become the predominant mode of production across the globe. Matt, thank you for, f- thank you so much for coming on the show. How the hell are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Great, great. Yeah, so... You did uh, you did the series on um, on you know the presence of the United States uh, and and you know it was really good. So why go from that to talking about the Thirty Years' War? What what drew you into that particular conflict above something else? Well, it was uh, at uh, like Hell of Presidents. It was a topic suggested by uh, Chris Ray, our uh, producer at Chapo. Uh, mm-hmm. When we came up, when the opportunity came up to do projects. You know, separate from the show, uh, one of the first ideas was like me doing something historical, and mm-hmm. Chris suggested, "What about presidents?" Because I, I tended to get wound up on the subject of presidents, so <laughs> be a good framework. <laughs> so we did the show, and we kind of realized as we were making it that what we were really describing is how uh, like capitalism is practiced in the United States, the context of the United States, the settler colonial project that it was. Mm. Uh, using like uh, uh, a capitalist engine that was produced in the the fires of 17th century Europe and yep. applying it mm-hmm. basically to this different context, this different uh, material reality, uh, and then how it is able to essentially uh, uh, sublimate all of the uh, contradictions of that uh, mode of production through uh, land and free labor and uh, dominated labor those kind of things uh and how that then because it becomes this stable political structure is able to exercise you know global power on behalf of this new globalized capitalism and mm-hmm. so when we got done chris said hey i was always thinking what about the 30 years war uh because that's a subject that you know gets kind of under discussed and also has a lot of these same themes and at first i was like oh yeah i hadn't i hadn't really thought of it honestly as an option because, uh, you yeah. know, I'm mm-hmm. not really a medievalist. Uh, it's not my specialty. So I was sort of like, it, it was a little outside my bailiwick. But once he started talking about it, I was like, oh, yeah, this is the next step. Because if we're describing this end, this, the end of this process, well, then it makes sense to that we'll be able to get even more detailed and, and uh, a deeper understanding if we look at its beginning. 
And mm. we realized that the, the Thirty Years' War can stand in for this mid-17th century explosion that rippled across the entire world. I mean, mm. the, Qing, the, Qing dynasty, or the Ming dynasty collapses in, uh, in China at this very time. And um, there's like four coups in the Ottoman uh, Empire at the same period as well. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, throughout every like, large uh, huge human uh, civilizational settlement around the world, there's these huge ruptures caused... Uh, in large part by the Little Ice Age, by the this huge climactic change. And so uh, I think the way we want to sort of frame it as to understand how capitalism comes into being out of this, you know, mode of production, feudalism that had been extinguished in practice in a lot of ways, but still held political and ideological and, and cultural hegemony. How, how, mm-hmm. how, does, the, how does that uh, um, stalemate break? And I think the way that uh, we describe it and the way that makes sense to visualize it is it's like a toothpaste tube. You've got, uh, you've got uh, a feudalism that is in terminal crisis. Its contradictions accumulated to the point where it can no longer move forward. It is only mm. going to eat itself from within. Everyone is going to try to save it. And by trying to save it, they will destroy it. Like that is the mm. dynamic that sets in because they can't. Because the the dominant political structure has no interest in changing a feudal mode of relations, even though it doesn't work anymore. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. they're not going to change it by themselves. The change has to come from below. But the whole point of below is that it's below. The people there do not hold, wield power in a way that can direct the flow of events and channel things like the technological innovations that have exploded during the same period because of the demographic mm-hmm. boom and all that. And the new and the right. new liquidity in the economy caused by greater circulation of species, like mm, this is mm. creating these the conditions that can deal with things like oh a huge drop in productivity of agriculture that is ex- caused by the little ice age exacerbating one of soil exti- extinguishment just because mm. of you know non uh, improving our agricultural practices. Yep. This is yep. a thing. This is a new way of doing stuff that could, if it was coordinated into a project that brought together culture and technology uh uh and 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 production then it could uh adjust in the face of this seemingly existential apocalyptic and everyone who was alive at the time thought of it in an apocalyptic terms challenge and they did they saved they saved the ship and by docking it in america they ensured its (laughs) uh its eventual world domination but uh yeah but we're but but when you see this happen the pressure of of, uh, ex- of existing contradictions plus the accelerant of climate change mm. pushing a situation where people in that middle strata are able, due to um, the liquidity of the situation caused by the explosion of violence we're talking about and the mm-hmm. state capacity built by fighting these wars, mm-hmm. uh, creates a new structure, a new, a new political structure that can – actually right. effectively address conditions and not just sort of react to them until it annihilates itself, which is what's happening everywhere else. Yep. Uh, but again, the people at the top will never do this. It goes against their interests. So only those who can find a material interest in doing so are going to actually be motivated to do it. And that is the city people. That is the, wor- that is mm-hmm. the uh, merchants. It's the burgers. Yeah. The reason that they're called mm-hmm. the bourgeois. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they are able to bring together a bunch of things that had emerged spontaneously out of the collapse of feudalism, like the printing press, like Calvinism, yep. uh, like double-entry bookkeeping, uh, the joint stock company, <laughs> uh, fucking star forts, and, uh, and uh, rifled, mu- you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're able to bring it together and, and a, a reform, restructure the social order. But of course... Mm-hmm. In so doing, seeding the very uh, destruction of that order in time once it can no longer deal with adjusting material conditions, which we are now also Mm -hmm. facing, and like them, facing a situation with a extinguished, uh, uh, a a mode of production that has extinguished its usefulness and ability to deal with the world as it is, Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. but a ruling power that is incapable of addressing that for fear of losing their privileged position within it and that causing or at least contributing to a accelerating crisis caused by climate change the system kicking in basically uh to show that something has to give here but which a call that cannot be recognized by 
any ruling elite, which is why uh, the conditions of change are always going to be a uh, uh, crisis and, and, uh, uh, and, mm. and often violent and deadly crisis. Yeah, this, uh, so, I mean, I'm just sitting here nodding and going, yeah, fuck yeah, man, like, the whole time, because uh, I don't, have you ever heard of, uh, there's this uh, historiographical concept that we uh, call uh, the, the general crisis of the 17th century? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah which has come up uh, with by Hobbes Bond. so uh, basically everything that Matt just said is kind of like uh, rolled up in there, which is just basically like, all the institutions are fucked, you get, you got like widespread financial issues, and then it, it's all just kind of like hits into this period of muck. And the thing that I really like to point out with this is exactly what you were just talking about, uh, Matt, which is, you know, over and over again, I was constantly telling people, you know, England's not that fucking important. Like in the medieval period, people ask me things about England all the time. And I'm like, man, I don't care about England, right? Like England doesn't mean anything. It's it's like a poor little backwater that's on the edge of society. But that's why you end up seeing England really kind of come storming forward at this time because they have the most to gain. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, institutions such as, you know, sure, the Holy Roman Empire is kind of like falling apart at this point in time. But, you know, they dig their heels in because they're very, very important and they've got a lot of land and they're like, no, fuck it. We can't let this go. England's got nothing to lose. Who cares mm. about England? Right. And they're like, well, we we're, we we're tiny. We don't have any land. It's like, come on, everyone, get in a fucking ship. Let's see who we can go like colonize because yeah. there's there's nothing to uphold at home. So you see, like, these smaller places, like, I mean, the Dutch really, yes. really go, for, they go for it so hard because, like, again, like, they're like, we live in a swamp. Sure, like, we, we make a lot of money off of wool or whatever, but they have every single reason to get in a boat and see what is going on over in Asia right now. And it's because there's nothing for them. So, you know, that should, I think, give us hope as, you know, the small people now, because it's like, well, maybe, maybe we can get something out of this. Yeah, no, it's like same way. the crisis is horrifying, but all the conditions, everyone is acting in their, in the narrowest short of interest to keep it going. Like everyone in power is doing that. They're doing what they think will keep it going because they depend upon it. They really are. Like there's the conspiratorial dumbass brain tells you, no, they're trying to destroy this. They think it's good. No, they want to keep this going this is all they care about. Mm-hmm. They don't think they can because they've lost control of it. Uh, the same way that the that the feudal rulers had lost control of the social structure, uh, but that means that everything they do to try to keep it is destroying it, and it by destroying it means creating new conditions that people are going to react to in a fresh way, and it's going to create new relationships to our ecology that are going to deal with that. Now that could be bad, it could be good, it's going to be both, obviously, but it's going to be a synthesis. It is going to be a moving forward. Of uh, what had happened before. I really do think that's true. But people are just so, we have so fully identified capitalist reality as human civ- civilization, as the human race, that the idea of it being like destroyed rather than reformed from within in a less violent way, uh, that becomes an apocalypse the same way that the medieval or the late medieval early modern people thought that they were in an apocalyptic moment. Like it's the exact same mindset. Like we have the, the same lack of any faith in a future. Because our systems can't produce a future. But a a future got produced anyway. Against anybody's knowledge or understanding that that's what they were doing. And who, by the middle strata within countries, and then by the middle strata of countries. The Goldilocks countries. Not the the overweening um, political structures like the Holy Roman Empire. uh, Or the fucking uh, gold-rich... Iber- what, what, are they, why, why are they going to hustle? They're in the Mediterranean sun and they have yeah. free silver just pouring in their uh, ports every day. It's, <laughs> it's, it's the dream, passive income. It's the dream yeah. of every hustler. Why? Yeah. That's, what you, that's the view you grind for. Then you chill. <laughs> and the grinding, of course, is being done on other people in other lands. That makes it a oh, lot yeah. easier to do. Yeah. But like, why? If you're the Mediterranean, why are you going to? Why are you going to ru- raise yourself? And of course, you know, in the far east, there's not enough. There's not enough mm-hmm. resources. There's not enough fertility. There's not enough population. More than anything, coming from mm-hmm. those things, uh, mm-hmm. to make anything really happen. It's in a densely, uh, a densely populated but relatively resource poor part of the western half of Europe that is going to. It, it has to emerge from. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That. The like the way that that England, you know, they they obviously were involved in the political and diplomatic aspects to an extent in the Thirty Years' War, but the way that they just kind of stayed out of everything mm-hmm. and were 
largely unaffected by it in a number of ways. And so they were just like, well, that happened. I guess we're going to go to America now. You know, like they just saw it and were like, no, nah, yeah, me. check, please. Fuck I'm, I'm done. With- yeah, <laughs> exactly. They just had no nowhere to go with it. Yeah. So, um, you know, one thing one thing that we talked about with the 30 years war is just you've got this like. Your very Eurocentric conflict about largely about schismatic religion and dynastic politics, and it's in a lot of ways mostly constrained to the German lands. So, like, how does that end up having this extremely outsized effect and this global importance on everything? And it, you know, spanning for three, four hundred, three hundred years after it happened. Well, the glib answer uh, is the Treaty of Westphalia, and of course, people will say, "Ah, excuse me, no." <laughs> wasn't the first of all there was two treaties in a piece get it right uh but also <laughs> the, there's a pushback on the idea that the west the treaty of westphalia created anything and i think that's true right. like from a pedantic point of view yeah it, it did not make the modern state but it, it it was a ritual sort of legal recognition of a change of affairs that had occurred without anybody mm-hmm. knowing it and that had been manifested by the mass violence of the 30 years war and necessitated finally this ruling class to do something, to recognize it. And it creates this, or uh, as I said, it does not create, but recognizes a new uh, structure that takes away, that uh, abolishes the attempt that had dominated the uh, medieval period to reestablish the Roman Empire in some form, to to create universal monarchy in some way across Christendom, to to have Mm -hmm. the religious and political uh, uh, powers once again fully overlap within Europe. Like, that's what everybody is pushing for one way or another by advancing their dynastic claims. But, of course, they can't do it in, the, in those conditions. Europe will not allow mm-hmm. it geographically, uh, uh, environmentally. It, you, you can't, once that thing is broken, it cannot be rebuilt. But everyone's been trying. And, of course, the Holy Roman Empire is the, is the largest remnant of that effort. Uh, and post-17th century... Europe will no longer be a site for that kind of uh, uh, politics. It will instead be a competition among medium-sized polities for uh, preeminence among them. And Mm -hmm. uh, that competitive framework drives all of these elites into acceding, basically, to the demands of their burger class against even their own perception of their long-term self-interest, but out of a desire to maintain their short-term control over those political structures. Mm -hmm. And once that happens, all these innovations that had emerged sort of spontaneously and that also emerged in places like China and India, uh, but there were suppressed away from one another by a centralized imperial state that had no no interest in seeing uh, a a, uh, revolution. It didn't, because it didn't need to. It had no real threat to itself, no existential threat. But these political classes in these medium-sized uh, states have an ex- are existentially opposed to one another. They won't uh, create a new empire, but they will overthrow their control over their own place, their own area, because they're going to be fighting over control of resources and territory with the same war structure they have. War doesn't stop at this point. It doesn't get replaced with commerce. It explodes. You've got uh, wars of Austrian and Spanish succession. Uh, the, the Seven Years' War, it becomes endemic to the continent all the way until World War I. Uh, right. But it's it, <clears throat> the political structures are no longer going to, dominated by <clears throat> a confessional politics that seeks to impose a uniformity of religion. That's gone. And with that, yeah. you have this new diplomatic reality where different states' sovereign context is respected. Like, you, you're, you're France, you're Spain, okay. I'm not going to claim that I'm the, I have the kingship of you and I'm going to take over. I, that's not going to happen anymore. You're your own thing. <coughs> Sorry. But we are going to um, compete now uh, for the same p- power and prestige that we had. Uh, and that is going to supercharge thanks to the technological and cultural innovations that have been accumulated, that's going to be supercharged by motivated states like the Dutch trying to get away from uh, Spain, Mm. uh, get out Mm. from under the Spanish yoke, and the the Brits trying to fucking keep their heads above water as this Mm. backwater fucking uh, uh, sheepfold 
Mm. That was mainly yeah. just a one. It was just a one export economy for for most of that period. It was it was it was a petro state for fucking wool and yeah. <laughs> and. There, there, those motivated states and their incredibly motivated middle classes, mm-hmm. uh, because they're the middle classes forged in those conditions, those mm-hmm. precarious conditions, are yep. going to take take the reins. And once they take the reins, that's the divergence. That's the rocket ship exploding. That plus, of course, the providential deposits of coal uh, in England that yeah. allow for this like literal supercharging of the technological uh, uh, co- social structure that blow the whole thing open and i find that so funny you know like as someone living in this godforsaken country for my sins or whatever and (laughs) the hopeless tory wasteland of england (laughs) right it's it's really funny and interesting right because you know england gains so much in this period because of that you know because it was just like well yeah this is where we keep the sheep or whatever they really go hard on you know uh, for a banking and stock and you know double entry bookkeeping and all these things and of course you know there's the whole coal thing now, of course, we're out of coal because thanks, Margaret Thatcher. Peace, you know. I'm like, and don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not here to be like, yay coal. I'm more like, yay miners, whatever. Uh, but we're still, it's so obvious, right, in the hinge point that we're at now that this country has no ability to lead any form of reform at all whatsoever because we're just completely dependent on like being a banker. For, for the world, and that's the only thing that we can come up with. And so that's why you end up seeing, you know, bullshit like what happened to us in 2019 at the elections and things like that, because any form of reimagining it just screws us. So it's going to be really, really interesting to see what happens when we have these kind of, like, middling places. It's like, you know, what's the Nigeria about to do? I'm really interested in, like, what's going on in, like, these really fast-growing places that have tons of tech and a lot of people who are going to do something really, really interesting in the, in the next little bit. But it just shows us how we can still learn something in theory from the 30 years war. You know, we look at the 30 years war and we go, here's all these things that it's done, but nobody ever learns the historical lessons. They just do it again. And we're just doing it again right now, but in, in an incredibly stupid way, you know? Like, yeah. Yeah. Just full steam ahead. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, 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 yeah. But as, as the, the eternal cry of the capitalist. Uh, yeah, but I'm different. Mm-hmm. It's like yeah, sure. This 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 holds everywhere else that I've ever watched, but maybe I'm one of the elect. Have you ever considered that? Mm-hmm. And you know what? If I really if I act like I am one of the elect, I probably am, and that makes yeah. me that that replaces the belief that used to be sustained ritually, uh, and is now just by me going out in the market and making my bread. That becomes my fucking religious practice. Yeah, because you made yeah you you made the money you made the. Uh, you you made you made the big bucks and so therefore you know you obviously are of better stock than yeah. uh than 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 your inferiors who didn't make the money and that's not because of circumstances or dumb luck or who your family is it's you know because you're genetically special and therefore better you're a left yeah. baby god god kissed you on the forehead before you were born <laughs> exactly yeah well yeah speaking of uh of religion so you know, Thirty Years' War obviously doesn't happen without Protestantism and the Reformation. But you know, how did it get from a schism in Western Christianity to you know the total breakdown of public religion as a guiding force in Europe, especially after the—I mean, during the war, but especially after it? Uh, well, because it becomes <clears throat> a wedge to sort of pry away the more uh, 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 socially and economically febrile parts of Europe from the more uh, uh, politi- uh, feudally dominated ones, because mm. you had a few, you has the feudal structure still ruling over Europe as a hegemony, but in specific places, uh, there was not a, a, a powerful extent extension of uh, a feudal authority. Like for example, in the Netherlands, uh, there really isn't a a, uh, a feudalism per se ever established in the Netherlands, uh, in the Low Countries. You have counts, you know. Uh, and you have uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, powerful families like the, the House of Orange being the preeminent one, uh, but they have no, uh, they never really were able to extend legal authority over the smallholders because that part of Europe would have required too much capital investment to make profitable for the, for any sovereign to to actually endure the cost of. If they want to make more money, you invade your cousin's shire and take it over. 
You do not you <laughs> not take the money that goes to your ermine coats and your pewter mm. uh, uh, hats and whatever the fuck and gestures. <laughs> you not the stuff that is, affirms your actual status and power in the hierarchy of your cousins. You're not going to fucking take that money and spend it to what get uh, to dredge uh, a river and fucking build some uh, um, windmills mm. uh, and, and and sink money into some boring bullshit <laughs> like dikes. <laughs> fuck that. All that work in the Netherlands was done by peasant associations yep. who came together and said, hey, the, the, instead of the, 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 the surplus in labor we would give to our count, who, because he does not offer this uh, uh, service, essentially, is not able to extend his legal authority over the, the people the way he has other places because the reciprocal relationship that defines feudalism is not able to be per- ex- persist because, again, mm. they have to do mm. literally all of the work. And, yeah. and spend all the money, so they take that that what would have been required to give to their uh, to their feudal lord in other parts of Europe, they're able to put together, use to build the dams, to build the dikes and the and the canals and the windmills and the superior uh, fishing vessels, and they're able and they're all able to do that because they're trying to survive, trying to make it not as a polity dominated by a feudal lord, but as a bunch of hustling fucking. Uh, mm. uh, people, individuals trying to make it instead of uh, uh, Hobbesian personifications of a dynastic <laughs> state and family structure mm. that everyone has to be uh, dependent on. Everyone has to be uh, accounted for, and that's why when when this breaks out, when when the feudal, when re- the Reformation breaks out, uh, sovereigns are basically universally opposed to it. Yeah. Uh, any sovereign is like, nope, get out of here. The princes of Germany are, are, are Protestant and curious, but they're not sovereign. Mm. So they have mm-hmm. that precarious relationship to power. And so this challenge to a, 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 a church authority that buttresses royal authority is mm. advantageous to them, just as it is to the, the city people of Germany. And there's tons of city people in Germany, which is why that's yeah. where the Reformation starts. Uh, yeah, and, and, that, and that. I was just going to say, and there's tons of city people in in the lowlands too, because yes. they, because because you can't farm, right? It's like what what what, what countryside? It's like that is a ditch, you yeah. Know? And like, and all there is is cities that are you know making cloth, and they're they're bringing stuff in from other places, and they're making wool and cloth, and that's what they do, and they've got a ton of money, and they are a network of cities, so everybody is le- literate, right? Everybody's literate. Everybody like goes back and forth a lot. Everybody travels. Everyone talks to other people, and they've got money. They've got no one looking at what they're doing, and they can read, right? Like, and that's... and and like even even the feudal structure that does overlay it, and it does exist. You know, the, the counts and whatnot, uh, and then of course mm-hmm. the Habsburgs. You know, as as, as their over their eventual God dominators. Bless them. But even the interests of those people, those those uh, counts, are aligned mm. uh, because. Uh, of their relationship to the the House of Habsburg and their mm-hmm. uh, their independent interests uh, there. I had another thing, but I'll get back to it. I can't remember. Okay. The Dutch are just fucking. I'm I'm obsessed with uh, I'm obsessed with the, the little swamp guys. I love the Lowlands. Like I mean, in the first place, I like uh, the silly made up Flemish and Dutch languages, which I don't think are real. No. Uh, and and I like and I'm really into cities, so I like seeing what it is that people do there and. They're, they're like these fascinating little gremlin people across uh, the Middle Ages just because they've got tons of money, but nobody knows what to do with them, pretty much. And they oh. just kind of like get ignored. You know, now, right? I'm sorry. I remember what I was trying to say. Yeah, go on. Uh, go ahead. So they still have, uh, they still are like a polity bef- before they get absorbed by the Habsburgs. They're, they're mm. this dukedom, the du- dukedom of Burgundy, which for a while is a computer competitor among like the sovereign states of europe like mm-hmm. the, the the duke of burgundy is is trying to extend his power like it, uh, that is a project you know they ally with england during the hundred years war and then after they leave they sort of try to take the place of the english as this uh, alternative source of sovereignty in in that area uh but uh you know they're they're just too poorly disposed to do anything about it other than eventually get owned charles the bold r.i.p uh but in the, <laughs> but, but because of that because of that they're uh, motivation in that you know contest, uh, the uh, Dukes of Burgundy are dropping huge racks mm. on the fineries, on uh, wonder rooms, on uh, balls and shit. All of all of the uh, utterances of power that affirm it. That all requires people to be making it all day, and that creates mm. a, a, a this suction, this 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 royal circulation of currency 
back from the extraction economy back into the urban economy that that uh, bring, that brings them together again because they're a middling power until mm. the Habsburgs show up, at which point the uh, conflict becomes uh, unsustainable. The contradiction is too deep there mm. because mm. you no longer have this uh, this uh, Burgundy Duke. You have this extension of a Habsburg dynasty that has no interest in competing that way mm. because it does mm. not feel the same existential threat that a uh, that a lowlands or an England does. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um... Oh, 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 O'Reilly. Don't risk getting stranded with a bad battery. Our professional parts people at O'Reilly Auto Parts will test your battery for free. If your battery does need to be replaced, we'll help you find the best battery for your vehicle and your budget. Don't wait until your battery is dead. Get it tested for free today at your local O'Reilly Auto Parts store. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. Auto Parts. Where can you Black Friday even more for even less? Lowe's, actually. Save on a Craftsman 51-piece gunmetal chrome mechanics tool set. Was $94.98, now $49.98. Or a Craftsman 20-volt drill kit, now just $59. And get festive with a Holiday Living 7-foot Lewiston Pine pre-lit artificial tree, now only $99. Black Friday is now. Don't miss the deals at Lowe's. Home to any possibility. Offer valid to 11:30. Watch supplies last. Selection varies by location. It's Macy's Friends and Family Sale with an extra 30% off the gifts you'll love to give and get 15% off beauty with your coupon or Macy's card. That's on top of big savings like 25% off dressed up designer looks for kids from Calvin Klein and more. Plus an extra 25% off luggage from Samsonite, Delsey and more. Download the free Macy's app for more great deals at Macy's. You know, um, Earlier, you were uh, you had mentioned uh, a little bit about climate change um, in uh, in in starting or being a factor that leads to the Thirty Years' War. So, like, how did the little ice age, uh, you know, help lead to that and help make it worse? Because I'm very interested, you know, in the idea that regardless of all the stuff that we do and all of our material circumstances and everything like that. At the same time, the planet is, you know, this giant thing. And when it, when it changes patterns or, or, you know, climate gets worse or in as the case now where we're making the climate worse, you know, it's just, we, we can't, we can't compete against that. That just changes the game utterly. Right. Well, you got to remember that the little ice age uh, happens in a context where, uh, Euro- European agricultural productivity has been on a uh, decline because of the underlying depletion of soil. Because the, fe- the feature of feudal uh, mode of production is that there is no structure within it to mandate, to motivate towards uh, um, improvement of agricultural yield, improvement of the soil. There's, there's nothing to make anyone do it. If you're a feudal uh, peasant, uh, and you're giving a percentage of your uh, labor and, and surplus to a lord that you don't you as long as you have enough to eat and sur- yeah. sustain yourself, that's as much work as you would want to do because it sucks. It's ba- It's unpleasant. Mm-hmm. It's tedious. Mm-hmm. It is a thing that all all structures exist to keep people from having to do basically in one area by making them having to do somewhere else. Like that's the essence of a class society. Uh, and mm-hmm. so. Without that motivation, that soil before even the Black Death was in de- decline. But then the Black Death sort of clears the board and creates this conditions plus medieval warming warmed period at that point that explodes p- demographically, and you have yeah. a huge uh, explosion in the population of Europe. Uh, but at the same time, the soil is getting more and more depleted. And then in those conditions, when the surplus that the system used to depend on is imperiled in the long term already and is sh- the margin is shrinking in those conditions uh there is this drop in temperatures uh like two and a half degrees i believe mm-hmm. over that period mm-hmm. that uh just destroys agricultural productivity destroys harvests entire harvests with late frosts and and, and rain uh but also um stunts the amount of production that can be found from any individual harvest and with that conditions uh you know, you you have famine, you have mass ex- huge explosion in the cost of food, mm-hmm. uh, and all of that creates 
huge social misery at a basic level that then has to be metabolized by the system. Uh, and that is why so much of the ferment of this period is religious in its framework, because that is the language people had to assert a, a common humanity in the face of suffering. That, that, there was no political sphere outside of that. So mm. that is what people, uh, that's the language people took. So the Reformation, I really think, is like partly an attempt by Luther and people like him to try to rescue the social structure that feudalism had uh, created uh, mm. from itself, from, mm. stop, from stopping the Lord's, from everyone from the Lord's down, from acting in the selfish way, the ungodly mm. way that they had been. Mm. If they just read the Bible... If they just if they just heard God's word themselves, then they wouldn't have to have faith in institutions and rituals that were corrupted and tainted by association with a system that was immiserating people over time. It was not promising anything other than uh, the tomorrow being worse than today was. Yep. Yep. And in, and if that is true, then there has to be some way to every human will try to express it I'll, I'll, their opposition to that. And, and uh, the Refor Reformation becomes the language of that resistance. Uh, and, and some people take it to its logical conclusion, like the Anabaptists, who mm. push it to the bounds of its political structures. But a fat, happy monk like Martin Luther, who is like, as soon as he gets a brewery and a wife, he's like, oh, my God, this is awesome. Yeah. Life rules. Everything's great, yeah. <laughs> I get to sit around the table with my bros all day. I get to fucking write letters to everybody. I get to troll. I get to post. Yeah, like he's what? a poster. <laughs> he's a yeah. poster. He gets to post. The yeah. system allows, even though this is the, these are conditions of the scarcity and, imp and, and, and miseration I'm talking about, not for Marty Luther, mm. not for mm. him. For him, the system yeah. provides. Yeah, he's and having, Hellboy, yeah. yeah, like he's, he's 100%, like you hear him, like when all the peasants get hold of yes. the, the, the him and they're like, all right, that's it, now we're revolting. He's like, now hang on just a fucking minute. Hold on, like, folks. I, 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 nobody said that the poor people are supposed to uh -uh. change. They're just supposed to, you're just supposed to pray in a different way and right. keep doing the thing. And but, like he explicitly gives the game away in that one. You but know? the thing is, like, even he, of course he's self-interested, but that self-interested in self-interest is laminated in his true belief because mm -hmm. like if you told he did not think that's why he thought that he thought that because he truly believed if everybody got the gospel they would all believe like he did and therefore the princes would stop being inquisitive the princes yeah. would let things change to help uh, feed people would would mm -hmm. ch would change their relationship of to power would relinquish power maybe even in in mm -hmm. order to save uh in order to uh, up uphold their fellow Christian their fellow Christians and that is mm. that's he had a real belief. All the reformers had a true belief in that, but by but all their actions b were bringing about the end of the system that sustained that God, mm. the God of Luther, because the God of Luther is I do believe the Cath a Catholic God, uh, uh, as opposed to the, the the Calvinist God who comes a little later. I, I think mm. those are different uh, conceptual concepts. I think that the God of Luther is in his like internally. Uh, it is different texturally, I guess, than the Calvinist God. I, he's more, he's closer. Like, remember, Luther, Luther will, uh, says of the Eucharist, he will not say, even though, the, even though his entire argument against sacraments is they're not in the Bible, even though the, the, the Eucharist is not in the Bible, he still insists that there is a true presence of God. Yeah. Of, in, 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 and he is willing to break with Zwingli and the Swiss over it, even though that is when they're trying to bring everybody together. <laughs> <laughs> but because his deeper uh, commitment is to the idea of a of a Catholic Church that mm. brings back an imagined Christendom, mm. but he doesn't mm. realize that it's too late for that. Because how could he? He's a fucking monk. How could he yeah. know what's happening? He yeah, had a chance to know. His dad could have taught him. His dad wanted to teach him. His dad wanted him to be a lawyer, become a hustler, and basically, uh, you know, uh, become Thomas Cromwell or whatever. Uh, but, <laughs> but that would have been for Luther surrendering his soul to this yeah. new life, this new world that he didn't want to be part of. And he wanted to stop it from happening. I think the Kelvin is different. Kelvin coming later, Kelvin accepts that this is now a colder place. The mm. world is, is, is the, the gods, like the glow, the presence has departed. Because mm -hmm. Luther says there's a presence in the Eucharist. You bring people around a piece of bread, and God is there in a way that means something. To that, to the Calvinists, no. There's the, yep. God has departed. God's gone. Mm -hmm. We cannot feel him anymore. We can only 
think him into being. We can only conjure him internally by acting as puppets, basically, by, by doing what uh, allows us to rise and to surrendering our Christian fellow feeling and saying goodbye to the notion that we can't uh, actually exploit and, uh, and uh, trick and, and, uh, and immiserate our fellow people. We can't do that. Now we have justification, just as, just as the, uh, the feudal lords were justified by their martial dominance. Now your, your success in the market has the same justification. Uh, but now in a world where you can't affirm religion ritually anymore, it, where, where the, 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 the assumption is of uh, estrangement, mm. uh, and that is the only religion that's going to be able to dominate the world and do what needs to be done to save class society from the deteriorating conditions of the 17th century. Yeah, I mean, this this is so much like exactly the sort of like bullshit I work on, right? Because like when you look at, for example, reformers in the 14th century, you know, if you look at the Lollards or like you look at like my pre Hussite Czech reformer stuff, right? They're kind of going on this, oh yeah, there needs to be greater personal uh, uh personal spiritual responsibility so like maybe see a little bit more of that and they're like but maybe we can reform the church you know and they're saying let's reform the church so like the church is pretty much fucked up as it is but like let's get in there and we'll tinker under the hood uh maybe we can hold a couple of synods we can like get these guys to stop being so corrupt and we can kind of go from there you get a little further on and the Hussites are like i'm afraid that it's fucked man uh, and we're going to just have to start a new church completely. Then you get Luther, who's like, yeah, agreed. But Luther and Hus, like and the Hussites, they're all on the, but we can keep the stuff, right? Yeah. Like, we can keep the presence of God. We can keep <laughs> the interventionist God, right? That Who yes. you pray to, who's interested in your spiritual salvation because he's like, yeah, I like that when you pray. You get to Calvinism and he's on this predestination tip. And it's sort of like, yeah, well fuck it you know like you know god's already decided what's happening you know yeah. the universe is almost an automata that he's yes. created and and it's wound up and it's just going to do what it's going to do so now you can say like well kind of fuck my fellow christians right yes. at least at least with medieval catholics they're like yeah it's bad like it uh yeah you know, i mean that's why they had to let the make yeah. the jews do it and then would periodically go and beat them up Right, exactly. And it's like, they know, they know, like, they're doing fucked up shit, right? They know yeah. that, like, the class system is bad. That's why they're constantly like, yeah, but when you die and go to heaven, everyone will be the same. But Calvin introduces this, uh, no, the class system's actually good, by the way, and it shows yeah. that God loves you. And it, it just brings in this whole other area of Christianity that we're still really suffering from. Like, every time I see some nonsense come out of some Republican in America, it's just Calvinism. Yes. Like, in the weirdest way, where it's like, I don't even really know what anything, what you're saying has to do with Christianity as a whole. But it does have to do with this idea that I am where I am in society as a result of, you know, someone got the wheel spinning, you know. And that, and that has been totally uh, secularized also, because you can't mm. find a terrain of... Uh, like uh, mainstream politics in this country that is not fundamentally Calvinist. Mm. Like, like the, 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 the broad le left liberal world is one of uh, the damned and the elect, but they're just damned and elected based on their, their political virtue rather mm. than uh, their, uh, their adherence to, you know, biblical behavior principles or whatever that it's still the same thing. I, I, I they, uh, we, I just, we, uh, for the show, we just read this article by these natalist like uh, tech fascists mm -hmm. who are all about, well, you know, to save the spark of humanity that exists in my son, Zephyr, uh, <laughs> we're going to sacrifice every other human on earth if we have to. Uh, and they call them, and they describe themselves as secular Calvinists. They said it explicitly. So like, yeah. because that's, that because that's the only way you can justify a class society is if some people are destined to be yeah. miserable because otherwise you could intervene, you could stop yeah. it, but that yeah. becomes a sin because it was a violation of it for the secularist nature, for the liberal, for the sentimental liberal, uh, uh, uh goodness, whatever the hell, uh, yeah. and for the, <laughs> for the, uh, uh, for the actually, you know, uh, the mythologically inclined, uh, the will of God. But either way, it's the same expression. We need to have a class society. We need to have regimes of domination in order to sort people. Mm -hmm. That's what yeah. the, the, so the social machine, the social engine of Calvinism that just that capitalism creates is mm. a sorting machine. Mm. Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh God, I lost just uh, like a tangent on this, like really quickly, because I lost my entire shit and like almost threw something at a wall. Uh, but like I saw a, a unfortunately, I, I once again was forced to perceive Elon Musk, and he was mm. uh, and he was giving a speech about how sex without procreation is illogical and yeah. like you should and just having sex to Ugh. enjoy it doesn't make sense. Yep. And I was like, that's a literal Thomas Aquinas argument. It's yeah. a literal argument that was made by Thomas yep. Aquinas, and yep. you've just like taken the god out of it and i fucking hate it it's yep. like and and but it, you can't understand that even if it is an aquinian ornament a, argument outside of capitalism right yeah because it's like well you have to strip out all of the pleasure of life yes. right and so even like day-to-day -day bodily functions have to be understood as like moving towards this goal and you have to listen to elon musk about it because he's got a bunch of money so like clearly he's yep. some guy that you should ask about <clears throat> sex because it's like uh, you know, it's either like you have sex for procreation or you're going to have to like offer your stewardess a fucking horse or whatever. Yeah. Right. And it's like, this is the guy. Because it's the, it's the materialization of the Calvinist, uh, uh, notion, the Calvinist idea, which is not, uh, uh, the individual as like a subject of God, uh, a submitter to God, mm. but rather, uh, uh, the subject as God, because the Calvinist God is in your head only, like we said. And mm. that means, uh, that the fear, the alienation caused by your like big other relationship, and to get Lacanian on it with with God means you are always subject to Him, even when you're sinning, even when you're doing bad stuff. He's in there telling you you shouldn't be doing that, and that means you can never really enjoy anything, right? And yeah. that is that's the thing that that's the that's the the hair shirt that's the mental hair shirt that the Calvinist applies, but. It's one thing, you know, if you believe you're going to hell, then that's a meaningful thing. Oh, God, no, I keep doing this. I'm gonna, and then so you keep thinking of hell. Oh, burning. Oh, my God, burning in a sulfur pit. That's awful. Oh, Jesus. Now, people nowadays can't sustain a real visceral belief in that as ap actually happening to them. They mm -hmm. cannot visualize hell. They cannot smell the crispy flesh the way that those people could mm -hmm. because time has gone forward. You know, we've had encounters with technology and, and so science that have stripped us of a lot of the load-bearing members of that old a belief in and ability to visualize actual eternal torment, but that mm. what that's replaced with uh, been replaced with is the existential terror at the thought of non-existence, mm. of of the of the of the blankness that cannot be perceived because it cannot be experienced by definition. Mm. So it is this 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 horror, and then mm -hmm. uh, capitalism becomes how to keep that horror at bay. Now you can't. Uh, you cannot do good deeds to get away from it. What you can do is distract yourself from it and yeah. find other uh, m mode places to fill that hole or attempt to fill that hole. And that's going to drive you eventually to, if you're at the top of this uh, heap, like our ruling class, where mm. you're that removed from humanity and your conceptions are that alien to human experience, that it becomes, oh, I must individually live eternally. My brain must continue right. forever right. so that I am be God. Because, yes, the Calvinist was terrified of the pit, but he also did have that belief that God existed, which mm -hmm. meant that there was a concept of heaven behind hell that could always underlie hell and kind of keep him on this, like, in, the, in, the, in the hamster wheel, basically, to keep yeah. him from saying, what is this getting me? Fuck off. You know, he mm -hmm. stays on the hamster wheel because there's that heaven, too. Uh, mm -hmm. and everyone, and you need that. And, and if you are an, an, an end of history, last man with no ability to conceive of an afterlife because science doesn't, says it isn't real, mm -hmm. then you are left having to construct your own fantasy because mm. living right. forever technologically is as much as a fantasy by these people's conception of like distant from science as a belief in God is. But it doesn't matter because it's more plausible. You're, it's easy. It's it. You can convince yourself of it if you're motivated enough. Even if you mm. b believe to be a rationalist, even if you believe to be scientific in your thinking, mm. even though it is as much of a leap of faith uh, as right. as believing in a god is. It's the exact same leap of faith, but it's it framed in a material terms, uh, and you're going to drive yourself into a fucking wall trying to pursue it. And bring the rest of us with them, with you. 
Well, yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, I think completely here as well, if we, if we think about that, you know, as, as these are the new limits of, you know, what what a theoretical heaven is, right? Like, so now it's Mars, right? We're all going to go live on Mars. And yeah, something, right. Something, something. And, 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 it, that, and that obviously, you know, it, it, it has this specific link in with, again, this, you know, Calvinist way of thinking about the world, right? Because it's like, oh, and also, by the way, it's a new frontier. So uh, don't worry, we're going to, we're going to sort all of the problems of, you know, limitations on, you know, the planet and the fact that you can't just like keep extracting it's like oh no 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 we'll go find another planet where we'll all be rich and we'll all live forever and then we'll find we'll find we'll find the stuff there guys and then there'll be more stuff and then we'll go to another you know and it's and it's capitalism it's, it's, destroyed earth and made it yeah. unlivable but we're going to it is going to make livable a completely inhospitable planet how it's, but but Which is it, just the stupidest thing. But it's, the day, it's literally, it is the literalization and materialization of the deus ex machina. It mm -hmm. is the actual machine, God machine. Mm -hmm. Which is what this is all, this, that's the Messiah. Yeah. Like, they, they were all looking for Jesus in the 17th century. They were waiting for Jesus to show up. And yeah. they were like, oh, we're getting all this apocalypse. We should, sure, sure we could use Jesus. Jesus ended up being uh, a, cal a capitalist. Jesus ended up being a fucking certificate in the in the Dutch East India Company. It it, it, <laughs> it, it, it it is not a guy trying to bring everybody together anymore. It's a guy. It's it, it's an object trying to turn you into an object. Mm. Uh, and but nobody, of course, can recognize that because their cultural uh, uh, reality cannot perceive it. And so, I think there is something because they did get a, like I said, they did get a messiah, and it was this technological structure that had emerged that allowed them yep. to adjust and create. Uh, stabilize material conditions and advanced material conditions uh, in Europe. But that Messiah, as I said, it could not be recognized as Jesus. These tech, the tech Messiah these people are looking for which is a singularity of some kind, some deal where we get so good at computer, the computer can do everything. Yeah. That, is, right. that is what they're thinking is going to break through all these uh, things. Like dumbass Elon Musk loves to say, I'm actually a utopian anarchist. Uh, Fuck and off. the thing is, he is. He absolutely is. He absolutely is. Because there is no other uh, social uh, uh, horizon than, like, world-spanning uh, Ian Banksian anarchist uh, facilitated by culture. But the thing is, guys like Elon Musk think, oh, you get there by allowing me to have all the money because I know what to do with it because I'm the, the, the God-defining, the, the world-defining uh, consciousness of genius that has transcended all others. Uh, and I got this, by the way, I got to this conclusion totally rationally. And using uh, epic science, I got to the point there. I am essentially uh, the Messiah. Oops. So I, I, I'm going to uh, do. But that doesn't mean that the, the technological structures that are going to get us past this, uh, get us through this bottleneck, aren't being built and aren't going to create their own uh, 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 cultural structures that reproduce them. They are just invisible to uh, the imperial. Um, gaze which is the only gaze we can use to talk to mm. each other with to, to, that's the only heuristic that we are have access to uh, to, mm. to, to, mm -hmm. to communicate through social media uh that it's invisible it's literally invisible to it just as the emerging capitalism was invisible uh to the to, to the feuding cousins who were destroying each other over these these questions that were mm. ending up only cutting their own throats destroying their own positions of power yeah yeah, and uh, I think I think with the uh, with the guys like Musk and uh, Peter Thiel, Peter Thiel, and and all those guys, it's like, you know, they they seem, you know, they they seem to be afraid of something like off in the future, like the extinction of uh, the extinction of the human race, like off in the future, like the sun's going to burn up and you know it's going to burn the earth. They they seem they seem so worried about the, that stuff. You know, they've transcended these concerns that we have now, these material issues that we have, where our world is you know getting worse and we can see it and and it doesn't look like there's any help on the horizon. They're like, yeah, 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 that's fine. I'm going to stick my brain in a computer mm. so that I can survive and they could stick that on a spaceship. And then when the earth can suit or when the sun burns, you know, expands in four, I don't know, four billion years or whatever it is to, to consume the earth, then at least I'll still be out there and my brain will still be able to, you know, shape humanity yeah. and the cosmos. Because you know, it's, perceiving... It's, it, their own per per persistent ego is the only value. Like, that's, that's what effective altruism yep. is. 
The fact of mm-hmm. is that the individual human ego is the ultimate uh, value of the universe because it uh, determines value. Basically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So therefore, it is the only thing that uh, means anything in the universe, as though there is no consciousness outside of the individual uh, human ego or that the ego is an actual, uh, like, meaningful uh, um, determiner of events. Like, we think we're acting as egos, mm-hmm. but we are actually mm-hmm. carrying out social roles. And mm-hmm. it is that social part is invisible to the capitalist imperial gaze. And it's that invisibility that's leading it to a destruction. And that is without them even knowing it, helping build something that's going to replace it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a perfect segue. You know, we've talked a lot about the 30 years war, but uh, another thing that, uh, that, you know, you've said your, your upcoming show is going to be about is the transition out of the, you know, the feudal mode of production and into the true capitalist one. So like, what are the big things that the 30 years war really sets in place for the final break of, you know, that feudal mode, whenever that comes, if that's when, if, you know, if that's at Austerlitz or, you know, wherever, wherever you set that in time. Uh, well, uh, I think a big part of it is that it, uh, as that it helps a step that I guess 30 years war as part of the greater, uh, the 80 years war, uh, is part of the process that breaks, that builds, uh, the, the Dutch Republic, and then allows it mm-hmm. to uh, uh, assert itself on the world stage and do things like essentially build the trade infrastructure that is going to make the world right. system. Uh, like this net, the, the triangle trade and the, the Atlantic uh, corridor and the fucking uh, the, the slate, the network of uh, slave, all these Calvinists uh, weather, weighing their souls on the fucking uh, 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 on, on, uh, against the weight of a feather are meanwhile building the fucking slave trade. Uh, so that is yeah. a huge part of it, is that, is that it, it creates these conditions. And it also uh, creates the conditions that fatally destabilize the uh, English monarchy, mm-hmm. which is similarly important in pushing things in the direction of this new social order. Uh, because uh, James I makes the decision that, you know, at the time appeared very reasonable to keep out of the 30 years war for the most part they sent some troops and some money and mm-hmm. some diplomatic missions uh uh but there was a, a concerted effort by james to try to balance the powers against each other and not try to have that holy war that the protestants were sort of or the creation rather of a holy alliance between protestant states uh that that was being sought uh and that did though have the effect of directing inward a lot of the social pressure that was being alleviated across the continent in these religious wars. Uh, and, and that led to uh, a, condi- a situation where the uh, very unstable Anglican uh, structure, which is, uh, comes out of the fact that the one sovereign who does sort of embrace the Reformation does so for entirely personal private reasons and personally continues being a Catholic and maintaining uh, Catholic uh, <laughs> sacraments and rituals in England throughout his life. Uh, and those things are all fundamentally inextricable from this explosion in Germany, which is the most, the most richly urbanized part of Europe, but the uh-huh. one that is uh, uh, paradoxically, but also inevitably, dominated by the most uh, thoroughly feudal social structure. Uh, and that contradiction is going to explode more violently than any other contradiction on the continent because of how deep and dramatic it is. And how the one thing sort of creates the other, because it's the light hand of the empire that allows these cities to do what they do in the first place, to start doing the sort mm-hmm. of uh, things that happened in northern Italy, uh, but a little later, and uh, in a condition, thanks to the Reformation, uh, where real uh, sovereign po- challenge to imperial authority can emerge, uh, and and that that is what sets the table, creates the array of uh, technologies, social concepts, uh, economic instruments, trade networks that can then be brought together uh, by first the bourgeois of the Dutch Republic, and then once they sort of get too high on their own supply and refuse to pay taxes to fight the wars they need to win in order to keep their trade networks, 
uh, the, mm-hmm. the even hungrier and more uh, schizophrenic, culturally schizophrenic uh, English, the more in need of some sort of uh, uh, economic expansion to quell the screaming social pain that's racking through their body politic. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. Um, oh, shit, I was going <laughs> to say something. And this time was going to say something. Gone. Okay. Yep. I was. I, I had something. You know, it was going to be the greatest, the greatest comment that we'd ever heard. Everybody was going to be stunned by my uh, intelligence. Yeah, I don't remember what I was going to say, um, Eleanor. Well, yeah, I, I was going to say that again, though. It's <laughs> like it, it stands up in terms of the, you know, what we were just talking about. So it's like you know this this kind of like a crisis that you have, like you know, England basically having this monarchical crisis and like getting their little civil war out of the way early, uh, meant that they like somehow. I have to deal with a new king now. It's the year of our Lord 2022, and I'm getting told that, like, you know, the Tampax guy is my king now, or something like that. <laughs> I don't know, like, I, I'm, not, I'm not a British citizen. He's not my king. Uh, so, like, let me, let's just make that clear. Uh, but it, it's really interesting because, you know, it is, you know, they, they managed to kind of do the conversion before you kind of get to the end of uh, feudalism in many other senses. You know, like they managed to, you know, because they're not on the continent, even though they're involved in the Napoleonic Wars, you know, these same kind of, um, you know, these same sort of hinge points that like bring down other monarchies or move monarchies into more caretaker roles earlier don't apply to the British. Um, And so we just had this like stupid tiny little civil war, which was actually just more about like, uh, I don't know, I think he's looking a little too Catholic. Don't you think he looks a little too Catholic? Yeah, no, that's, you you know, no, bring him back because we don't want to be like the French, you know, and then and then suddenly you still have a king you know, 200 years yeah. later, right? And, uh, and, and, and it's, it's wild. And these Dutch, it's like you see the synthetic emergence of this thing where the first mm. two, the, 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 the Dutch are precociously uh, bourgeois liberal in their politics like they, because of the relative weakness of the, of, of the stadtholder uh, uh, there. Uh, and they create this, this reduced monarchy, this cut-to-size monarchy uh, that... Has through the experience of you know fighting the the Spanish and you know their own burger class come to an understanding of the world and their place in it as mo- as sovereign that mm. the, uh, the 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 English kings cannot imagine like Charles the first cannot get his head around the fact that the world that the he, that the uh, realm he governed uh, was fundamentally different than the one that was in his head and no mm. one was ever going to be able to tell him otherwise no event was ever going to be able to prove him wrong. Because it's mm. deeper than that. It's a belief that transcends empirical observation, which we all have. When that's the yeah. big lie of uh, West of Western rationalism is that there is such a thing as a, a objective uh, perspective. We all have grounding beliefs that are totally immune to what the evidence of our senses. Mm. Uh, and for Charles, it was th- that that royal authority must be uh, uh, the, the the definition of royal authority uh, was this. Uh, power over transaction you know over the land that Mm. would not allow england to be a competitive uh stable uh polity anymore in the conditions Mm. of crisis that they were in uh and so they they the 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 parliament cut his head off but that that was precocious as well and Mm. so that emergent uh middle class is then able to basically shop around and find a monarch who will sit in the throne and do the do the rituals, but mm. in his head contain an understanding of his relationship to Parliament, to the people, to the market. That is mm. an entirely different world than the one that they cut off when they chopped Charles's head. Chopped Charles's mm. head. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, well, Matt, uh, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show. I think uh, before you go, I just, um, you know, I wanted uh, the Thirty Years' War has so many, uh, so many interesting guys. Oh, so, so many I good guys. Wanted, There's a lot yeah, of guys. So I just wanted to, you know, uh, take some time just to remember some guys. And I think the first one we have to start with is, uh, you know, Gustavus Adolphus. Oh man, why? why That's my boy. Why? Though. why the, why, the, why the, monarch, like? the one guy, the guy who, the one man argument in favor of monarchy as a uh, political tradition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because <laughs> yes. that guy fucking whips. I love Gustavus Adolphus. That's the I would I'd sign up for it. I'd be like, okay, why not? Give it a go. Sure. Yeah, because uh, yeah. you have with the Swedish uh, state this 
fascinating overperformer in its own way. Uh, it's never going to be able to be a, a, the center of capitalism because of its uh, distance from you know markets and resources. Uh, but uh, their political structure is able to be dynamic in a way that few others are because of its incredibly uh, flat social uh, distribution. It's 90% peasants. There's barely any uh, mm. noble mm-hmm. uh, uh, class for the king to uh, contend with. And that allows for this incredibly precocious state structure to emerge where they're doing conscription and for central taxation at a time when that is beyond the capacity of any of the Western European dynasties. And it produces this monarch who <laughs> leads from the front and is the Chad's Chad. Uh, he's got mm-hmm. his uh, he's got mm-hmm. his indoor kid nerd friend uh, Ch- uh, Oxensterna to bunch things off of. Uh, yeah, it's like th- this guy is is a dynamo, and and as a result, he just rolls over Germany. It's amazing. Like you go from a period where the Habsburg could essentially not lose. They were rolling double mm-hmm. sixes in every contest on the risk board. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were chasing Mansfeld around Germany with a fucking big mallet. They they <laughs> they sent uh, they sent Christian to Denmark running home to his mama. Go freeze your ass off in uh, Copenhagen, bitch. Uh, and they were even they were toying with the idea of of building a Baltic fleet and, and turning the Baltic into a, a Habsburg lake. Uh, and that triggers, among other things, the uh, this just steamroller to, to come in and just blow through Germany uh, and go from go from uh, Pomerania to Munich in a year and a half. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. But if you lead like that, by definition, you're taking greater risks than somebody who's mm. uh, staying home with the kids while the campaign's going on. Uh, and as a result, uh, the system, that structure they have is, is uh, vulnerable because it's so damn top heavy because it's so much of it is personified in the sort of world historical figure of Gustavus Adolphus so when he gets uh when he gets clapped at Lutzen uh that kind of breaks it's astounding how it sort of breaks the back of the the Swedish machine even though it hangs around you know yeah. for another yeah, century yeah, yeah. it's like once Gustavus is gone it's 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 a it's a one way ticket to uh Baltic oblivion once again for the Swedes Sorry, guys, yeah. you had a good run. <laughs> Thanks for Delaware, by the way. Really yeah. enjoying having yeah. Delaware we're... in this country. Fucking assholes. <laughs> really, really appreciate their, their chancery court having so much uh, say in over my life. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's great. Good, yeah. Thanks. So, yeah, so, Matt, uh, there are a lot of, of mercenary captains in, uh, in the 30 Years War. So, like, you know, who, who's the most interesting to you? Are you a Wallenstein guy? Or, or oh, I love – I mean, Wallenstein to me is fascinating. To me, he's the Richard Nixon of the 30 Years War. He's the middle-class kid <laughs> uh, and ability. You know, he is, he is, yeah. he is the middle-class in grievance bear, but also accessible to all the middle-class's skills and abilities because he's an incredible logistic – uh, and financial genius, he 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 is able to uh, lash together this uh, huge fiefdom through uh, lines of credit, and and through uh, uh, the latest application of uh, of rational business practices. Like he ran his lands like factories uh, to to mm-hmm. squeeze the most out of them, uh, and he applied that to uh, gaining this insane ab- amount of power in an incredibly short period of time. Uh, and hilariously, the 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 electors force Ferdinand to fire him because he's too powerful. And then as soon as Gustavus shows up and just kicks everybody ass and kills poor Tilly, uh, they have to get his ass <laughs> out of retirement. They, he's he's chopping wood at the at the homestead, and they ride up like at the beginning of Commando. Uh, <laughs> uh, but and and then he, but he he gets. Back in power, he's he's put back in charge. He gets a unified control, but immediately just starts deciding to freeball the whole thing and create his own peace and dictate his yeah. own terms for Germany. Uh, the whole time, racked by this deep resentment and anxiety relative to the uh, the feudal elites that he rubbed elbows with, who he never felt like he could satisfy. The same way Nixon always felt <laughs> the gaze of the Eastern establishment on him, and uh, and the way that he kind of drove through it all was fucking astrology the, like the idea the, the fact, like, <laughs> he doesn't have modern science to guide himself with he doesn't have our uh scientific method to mm-hmm. to 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 make our impulses appear rational 
which is what yeah. we do, this, which way we use that. Uh, but he needs something because he is a rational man of the modern age. And what is the closest thing to him that he can use? Astrology. And he does. And, he, and, he, and, and that helps push him through uh, to the eventual point where he gets clapped also uh, by uh, the emperor. And you see how like all the real emergent figures, all the people who really break the mold and burst forth, get their heads cut off. Just like yeah, the people yeah. who yeah. drag the farthest behind, like Charles I. Like the the advanced and the the advanced guard and the the the, the laggards tend to get chopped off, mm-hmm. and then it's the people in the middle who survive who make the thing. So it is yeah. like you see this winnowing towards mediocrity uh, among everybody, which is of course most boldly uh, past the Thirty Years, a little after the Thirty Years War ends, but is most personally manifest in Charles the Second of Spain, mm. where you have uh, 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 the feudal. Uh, order producing, uh, getting to like the terminal point of uh, of of cannibalism, where inbreeding leads to someone who is uh, a fun- functionally uh, uh, inca- incapacitated, uh, including mm-hmm. f- uh, incapable of reproducing, which is really all they need to do. More that they just need to make another one. That's all they need uh, to do. Uh, I hate thinking about it. Yeah, they just. <laughs> They just got down to the end, and they just couldn't... Uh, really scraping the bottom yeah. of the barrel, you know? Yeah. 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 This really fucked up. Yeah, I've, I, like, I don't know why I've never thought about that specifically. It's just really fucked up that, like, the only thing they needed to do was reproduce. Yep. Uh, and because of, you know, the compounding circumstances and, you know, genetics and things like that, you get to this last guy, and it's like, nope. Yeah, nope. it's now, like and now you rolled you yeah, rolled okay. sixes, uh, or I'm sorry, you rolled snake eyes here genetically. Yeah, yeah, Oof. yep. God. Yeah, and now and now what do we have? We have to deal with the the heir to the Habsburg throne uh, showing up in your uh, in your mentions on Twitter. Oh yeah, oh, Oof, I know. That, God. <laughs> complaining that tradcaths have been have been unjustly removed. <laughs> Mister Elon, please, <laughs> please restore the tradcast to Twitter. Please restore me to. Uh, I guess the Austrian throw. I don't know what the fuck he even wants. For a while, but, yeah. also, for a while, Habsburgs weren't allowed to go to Austria. They're, I think they're allowed. Oh, really? Yeah, they're allowed to again, but for a while, they were not allowed in <laughs> uh, because they were like, that's "No, awesome. like keep your chin over there, get the fuck out." But that's not <laughs> that's true. Awesome. You've done enough. Yeah. Like, yep. Don't you? I think yep. that you've enjoyed Vienna enough for everyone. Thank yeah. you. So. Yeah. Go home. Go. Go live somewhere else. Well, Matt, back to uh, Switzerland. Thank. Yeah. 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 Fucking robber barons. God damn it. Oh, Jesus. Uh, Matt, thank you so much uh, for coming on the show. I, one thing I did want to ask because we get some questions about this. Did you have any uh, book recommendations or you know things that you really like? Yeah. Uh, you and Chris are putting We're going series? to do a bibliography page that will direct nice. people oh, to cool. when okay. we launch it. But uh, some of the books that were most important for writing it for me were uh, – Chris has his own. Uh, but we'll put them all together on the website. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. for me, uh, obviously, C.V. Wedgwood's 30 Years War – it's yeah. not going to give you all the detail, yeah. but oh, the language is so good. It's, it's, mm. It'll make you yeah. care, which is what matters mm. way more than finding out what happened. But if you really want to know what happened, you can't beat Peter Wilson's 30 Years War, Europe's Tragedy. It gives you all the gory details. Uh, mm. And uh, you, if, if you find yourself uh, autistically attached to the subject enough to really want to get in there, then you can't beat that one. Uh, there's also a really fu- uh, interesting uh, comparative study of the crisis of the 17th century by jeffrey parker called global crisis it's really uh, good that is really yeah. good yeah uh so those are those three were really uh big on there but uh like you know uh the dearman mccullough's reformation book is really good okay. if you want to kind of get the the uh the sweep of that event across the continent mm. yeah yeah, cool. Well, thank you so much for that. And again, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, really love your stuff. Um, and, uh, and you know, really, really loved Hell of Presidents. Looking forward to uh, Hell on Earth as well. Yeah. Do you have uh, anything anything you want to plug before we go? Anything That's like it. That? That's the, the Chapo. We have a, we have a, uh, you can buy a, a yearly subscription now uh, if okay. you don't want to be on, on, a, on a plan. And uh, it'll be included in there. Uh, so, yeah, it'll uh, dropping hopefully January 11th. Nice. Cool. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And, uh, and we're looking forward to it. Uh, everyone else. Um, yeah. Eleanor, do you, uh, have anything you need to plug today? Ah, oh, same old, same old, please to buy my new book. Uh, the ones that feature sex. That'd be nice. I, you know, I'm quite tired, man. Buy, buy this fucking book. 
<laughs> otherwise, like that's that's the main one at the men. Thank you. Yep. And uh, yeah, as always, Luke is amazing on Twitter. Uh, you can find my old podcast, People's History of the Old Republic. It's about Star Wars. Find it wherever you're listening to this. Uh, but anyway, thank you everyone so much for listening, and we will see you next time. Bye. You're a holiday powerhouse. You host the dinners, shovel neighbors, sidewalks, and make everything from scratch. You definitely don't need help making the holidays happen. But Duncan's Holiday Blend Coffee? A warming medium roast complete with sweet notes of dried fruit and molasses. Or a cranberry orange muffin made with real cranberries just might convince you a little help never hurt. Especially the hot caffeinated kind. America runs on Duncan. Price and participation may vary. Limited time offer. Terms apply. Dan, so glad we were able to meet today. Thanks for coming over. Whoa, what's that? Pretty awesome, right? It's my new FlexiSpot E7 Pro Plus standing desk. Goes from sitting to standing with the push of a button. You know, I've been thinking about getting a desk like that. I have back pain from being in a chair all day. But I feel like they're either cheap and flimsy or crazy expensive. That's why I went with FlexiSpot. This desk is super sturdy but totally affordable. The base is made of automotive-grade carbon steel. Sit on it. Okay. Hey, this is cool. All right, I want in on one of these. Where do I find FlexiSpot? Just go to their website, FlexiSpot.com. And go right now because they're giving an extra $80 off their already low prices. Go to FlexiSpot.com and use code 80OFF to get an extra $80 off the E7 Pro Plus standing desk. Backed by an industry-leading 15-year warranty. Don't wait. This special offer will not last long. Go to FlexiSpot.com and use code 80OFF. That's F-L-E-X-I-S-P-O-T.com. Go to FlexiSpot.com now.